the flyer that hopefully drew all of you here. I want to suggest a few new questions that um, are, I think are important. And then I want to introduce some possible solutions and um, introduce some policy innovations here. So what is Jevons paradox? Um, I'm no expert on it, but I'll just, just quote uh, what, what it's supposed to be. You know, it's um, so this uh, economist from the 1800s, you know, was quoted as saying, you know, a holy confusion of ideas to suppose that the economical use of fuels, talking about energy, is, is equivalent to a diminished consumption. Uh, the very contrary is the truth. And it was argued at the time that, had, you know, steam engine improvements and steam engine efficiency um, led to increased consumption of coal. So that's what the paradox is. Um, you know, will increased efficiency help in reducing our environmental impacts? Well, um, you know, I like to take the approach, you know, what, what do we mean by environment? You know, are we talking commonly, I, in my experience, people talk about environment, they're thinking immediately greenhouse gas emissions. Well, okay, are you talking common air pollutants, greenhouse gas emissions, um, water quality or water depletion? Uh, are you talking environmental toxins like mercury? I mean, all of these things are relevant is my point. And so, you know, um, the short answer, because I said I'm gonna briefly address the, the posed questions, is that overall efficiency alone is not likely to be sufficient to, to um, reduce these impacts, okay? We, you know, we can have lots of discussions about that, you know, end of pipe controls, things like that, um, depending on what you're talking about. But m my view is that efficiently alone just isn't gonna do it. And we'll talk more about what efficiency is. So this is an article, uh, actually, my uh, colleague here, uh, Don, who, who graduated from our program at UBC, had uh, flagged this, and it's actually been published out now just this month. Um, so what this is, this is someone, you know, one of many articles that probably are relevant, but someone looked at the material efficiency of 10, um, 10 different materials uh, based on energy efficiency and consumption and looked at multi-decade timescales, okay? And so what the, the authors of this study, uh, the author, D Damis, who I believe is from MIT, published is that, okay, let's look on this vertical axis that changes in the quantity of consumption over time uh, as a percentage, right? And let's look at the efficiency, and they used energy uh, input per ton of whatever or per kilometer of travel or freight tons and things like that. So a very broad brush, and so they looked at improvements in efficiency over time and, and increases in production. And the key message here is that that little black kind of slightly upward line is if, if uh, consumption outstripped efficiency, then the dots would be above the line. And of course, all the dots are above the line. So you know, the point is, is that the rate of consumption this delta Q over Q thing that they call has outpaced efficiency historically. So this is some big broad brush covering a big part of our, you know, um, material economy. Um, that, that's just some facts to introduce into it. So how does the uh, increased efficiency, um, how often does increased efficiency uh, rebound into uh, increased consumption? Um, you know, I like to think, you know, did efficiency cause increased consumption or, or this so-called rebound? Uh, I mean, this is another thing, you know, the, the short story, I think, is, you know, did, you know, the causality is unclear. You know, there's cause and effect. Uh, I really advocate for using scientific methods where they are applicable. Uh, and of course, when it comes to our values and what we care about, you know, science doesn't tell us what we should care about or who we should like or what our preferences are in life. But if we're gonna make predictions about if this happened and then that happened, okay, that's where science can help us, okay? So the short story, I, in my view, is that the causality is not clear. Yes, I showed you one little spot of evidence for sure. Consumption's been going up. It's been outstripping efficiency by some measures, but did it cause it? I mean, if someone's gonna explore that, you need to look at what other things could have caused that. Confounders. Another question is, you know, would consumption at any scale, we could look at local, regional, you know, national level, global scale, have been less without efficiency improvements? So there's a body of evidence, there's been efficiency improvements. So, you know, a better question might be, you know, would consumption at any scale have been less without those? And um, 
again, you know, in simple terms, you know, what would have happened, you know, researchers would call that a counterfactual, right? We have what happened, the factual. You have to think about, well, what would have happened without all those efficiency uh, improvements, right? Well, it's very complex. Definitive proof, my prediction, if you will, it will never be um, produced. So I'm basically saying I, I don't think we need to dwell too much on the posed questions, okay? Uh, yes, efficiency has improved. Yes, our consumption has increased. Do we have definitive evidence that our efficiency caused that increase? I don't see it. It certainly may have been partial, but I don't see it. So here's Eric's new questions. How do we define efficiency in the first place? Kind of along the theme of if we're going to use science and scientific methods where they work, you know, we really need to think about what are we talking about in the first place? Efficiency. How, how do you, what do you mean by efficiency? So I'll show you. Uh, should conservation of energy and, let's say, other resources be explicit policy goals? Um, I, I really hope in the question and answer, I'd like to know where, is there any place on this, jurisdictions on this planet historically where conservation, and I'm going to define that soon, has actually been an explicit policy goal? So if conservation emerges as uh, explicit policy goals, what can we do? So what is energy e efficiency? And these can be applied to resources. So I'm going to give you a quick and dirty but there's, there's no one type of efficiency. So us engineers and physicists, we love our first law and second law of thermodynamics. That's one category of efficiency, right? Another we could call physical thermodynamics. Some of our other speakers here are very, uh, you know, into economics and you might, and, you know, efficiency means the utility you get per unit energy, miles of travel from a car per gallon of fuel, right? That's an example. Or you could turn that over and you might look at intensity, how much energy per 100 kilometer travel. There's another category. Then we might just look at you know, economic thermodynamic definitions, right? So again, at a bigger scale, economists love our GDP. So how much energy per unit gross domestic product? That's, that's an example. Um, one of the things I specialize in is um, end use energy efficiency, you know, uh, energy management of facilities, particularly industrial facilities. Well, a lot of industrial energy managers or managers of industrial facilities in general, they actually don't care directly about the energy. They care about the economics. So there's measures of efficiency that are purely in dollar forms with, you know, underlying, of course, there's joules and BTUs and all that, but they often, they look at, you know, the value of energy input per unit GDP. There's purely economic ratio. So, you know, if we're going to talk about efficiency, you know, there's ways where all of these definitions of efficiency conflict with each other. You can improve one and make others worse. And, and we really, you know, should just try and be clear about what we're trying to achieve. So should conservation of energy and other resources be explicit policy goals? I mean, uh, fast forward, I, my opinion, yes. <laughs> I'm assuming nobody. Um, but what is energy conservation? I've noticed some really bright people, very bright people, in fact, the very brightest people on the planet, <laughs> arguably, will say, well, we've, like Vaclav Smil, who is amazing, and you'll see many citations, and my students are tired of hearing me talk about Vaclav Smil. They laugh every time I even mention his name. But he's a, he's a Canadian uh, researcher at Manitoba, brilliant on the natural and, and, and applied sciences of energy systems, SMIL, read about him. But he's quoted as saying, we've had hundreds of years of energy efficiency and it did, did, didn't do any good. We've had hundreds of years of energy conservation, did not do any good. Well, what the, what's the purpose of having two terms for the same thing, right? Nobody's thinking through. So really, if we're going to be clear about reducing our resource consumption, let's put a name to it. Um, so, I find no consensus. Here's what I use. There's a specified system, um, you know, consuming less primary and final energy over a specified time period, regardless of the quantity or quality of energy services. So I'm going to touch on, on especially the things in red um, about, you know, quality of energy services, what's primary energy, what's final energy. If we want to reduce energy, we should be clear what we're talking about, because it is something we can measure. Um, so the basic idea is an absolute reduction in consumption, not just relative to some usually increasing baseline. So many of us have probably seen in, here in British Columbia the, you know, the BC Hydro Integrated Energy uh, Plan, where it shows you know, time across the, the, the horizontal, and it shows gigawatt hours per year. And of course, the, the baseline is this climbing over time of, of electricity consumption, but we're going to conserve. And we're going to put that on a steeper slope, but still an upward slope, right? Well, in my opinion, that is not 
That's, that's useful, that's helpful, that's progress, but it's not really conservation. Or if you don't want to call it conservation, call it something else, but we need to flatten that curve, right? That's, that's the basic idea. So I talked about energy services, primary energy, final energy. These are all things that science can help us. We can count these things, but we really need to think about it. So all of our energy systems can, can be constructed, if you will, and I'll say our human energy systems. We have natural energy systems that we're essentially a product of. And then we have our human produced or anthropogenic energy systems. Well, I have a little six building blocks and three connectors that you can use to diagram and kind of analyze, including policy analysis, all energy systems. So the starting point is we really want, us humans want energy services in a certain quantity and a certain quality. I, I should say, somebody give me some cues on time, uh, but, but I'm, I'm going to go, go quickly. So as an example, hot water, right? That's an energy service we want. And the key idea here is start with the services we want and then work backwards. So often in, in, in our world of energy, people just start with, oh, what's our supply going to be? What's the supply? The supply. Well, let's think backwards. What do we really need or want? And let's work backwards from there. Um, so hot water, I have one of these. It's a condensing hot water. That's called an end-use technology. Where did that come from? I used to supervise the gas distribution at UBC. There's polyethylene pipes running all over the place, including around here, I'm sure. Uh, carrier. Uh, we really want these final energy carriers, so natural gas is a carrier in this example. Now all energy systems, because uh, the, the rate at which we consume it doesn't always match the supply, so there's a mismatch in time, so all systems have storage. So LNG is actually used for storage. I don't know if people know, there's on uh, Tilbury Island, there's Fortis BC has LNG storage, and the reason they have it, winter peak, right? We all crank up our heaters in the winter. How are they going to match that demand? Well, they liquefy natural gas when the temperature is warmer, and then they regasify it and pump it into their system uh, close to the, uh, where the, all the demand is, which is us, in the winter. Storage. Then you go further upstream, and there's lots of big pipes and compressors, and we can talk about that. Then where did that gas come from, from the big transmission system? Well, it came from further upstream, it came as the output of a gas processing plant that takes sour gas and takes out all the impurities and makes it sweet gas, right? And where'd that come from? The famous fracking, right? There we go. And you might have cavern storage. So all energy systems can be diagrammed with this type of thing, and you've got transmission, distribution, and maybe transport to move things around. So I'm going to talk a little about energy services here. How much do we need? So I was at Costco in Richmond. Yes, I shop at Costco, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> I try and control myself, and I did in this case, except I had to take a picture. <coughs> Electric toilet seat. I mean, come on, give me a break. All right. You talk about matching supply and demand. I guess how many watts this electric toilet seat is? The nameplate. Anybody guess? 1,500. Another guess? One more guess? One kilowatt. One kilowatt. Okay. I've seen articles that said, our whole you can run the whole globe on one kilowatt per person like as a steady state, 1,000 watts. Well, this one happens to be 660 watts, right? And guess how much it cost, as a side note? How much could you get this for? 400, $300. $3,000 sold. Well, you could get it for 200 bucks. You get, what's my math? Without tax, you get 15 for 3,000 bucks? Anyway, so this is just an example. You know, this is a little humorous illustration. Our, you know, our consumption, right? How much energy, what energy services do we need? Do you need an electric toilet consuming 600 watts? Do you know how much, if you put solar panels on the roof of your house, how many solar panels to get 600 watts? I don't, I don't actually know what it does, but I understand that in Lansdowne Mall in Richmond, there's a whole store of these things, and you can go talk with them. So I'm going to move along. This is a telling graph about how much this is related to consumption. This is related to Jevons' paradox. So what this is showing is just a snapshot for various countries, ranging from some really uh, low-income countries to the very highest-income countries. And it shows on one scale, the, the, the pinkish bars, how much gigajoules of primary energy, not final, but primary, how much we consume per person. And then the other uh, bluish-green bars show this in, in this kind of aggregate measure of quality of life. And what you'll notice in this graph, this is another one that Smeal puts out, I think is a very nice summary, is that, you know, first of all, the, the lowest income countries have so little energy per capita, 
uh, low quality of life. But one of the main things is that up at around 90, um, uh, sorry, uh, 150 gigajoules per year, this, this breaks down. So more is not better, right? So United States, and by the way, Canada is just neck and neck with the United States. We consume about 300, 350 gigajoules per person per year primary energy. Even Japan, Germany, France, Italy, right? They, by some arguments, have every bit as good a quality of life for half the primary energy, right? This is a very important point. So there's many reasons to conserve energy. I have a big list here that I like to promote. I'm not, I don't have time to do it, but I, I will just say, you know, there's public health benefits, there's economic benefits and all sorts of things. One thing is limited supply of fossil fuels is not on this list. Yes, we're eventually gonna run out, but you know what? We, we have too much for, for the time scale at which us, us humans make decisions, right? That, that's not really on the list. There's lots of other valid reasons. We don't even need that on the list of why we should conserve energy. So, if I'm getting close here, I'm ramping, ramping down, but I've, I've got some good, good things coming. So if conservation is adopted, what can be done? Policy innovation. So, you know, I have two degrees in mechanical engineering. It's been a while, like 1990, got my master's. Um, I had the privilege of studying with some really bright people here in, in Canada at UBC on policy. So I really love that technology policy mix. And I really think, yes, technology innovation is important, Policy innovation is equally as important, if not more, but they're both very important. So policy innovation, I'm just gonna suggest a couple things. One, I'm gonna talk about very briefly transportation, and, and I try to give cues of people that I suggest who are, I think are, are or were thought leaders. So Vaclav Smil, a thought leader, definitely. There's many others. Uh, the late Lee Shipper was a thought leader around many things, including transportation. Um, so you might wanna go and watch his, his YouTube video and how he deconstructs you know, transportation and mode shifting and all that. Uh, smart growth um, is another you know, systems approach for transportation. Basically, um, you know, I think getting um, you know, people walking and cycling and, and you know, land use transportation planning is really critical. Because I'm an engineer and like my, my doctoral thesis was on passenger cars, people would come and ask, oh, you must know something about you know, what's the best car? or the best fuel, and, and my honest response is, well, it's the wrong question. The, the question is, what's the best mode to get around? So when it comes to transportation and energy policy, you know, we're, we're on a short timeline here. I'll just give you my two-bit conclusion, and we can debate the pros and cons. I'm sure there's, there's plenty of both. So when it comes to policy goals, we really need more non-motorized transport, walking and cycling, right? Not just to save energy, not just to avoid damaging our environment, but for our own good. You know, I started my career, my first job, I, I mean, I was lucky to get it, but I was at McDonnell Douglas in Southern California, and I had to drive like an hour, 45 minutes each way. I mean, I was lucky to get that job. A lot of engineers would have wanted that job. You know, little egghead Eric got his job, and, and over there working aerospace for three years, they, I did an honest work for three years, they paid for my master's, and I shifted over to what I really loved, which was energy and environment at that time. But, um, uh, you know, I st my point is I started that cr my career driving three hours a day and I'm so much happier now because I could literally run to work if I want or bike or hop on a bus, right? It's, you know, it's, uh, it's a much healthier lifestyle. And, and, you know, reducing environmental impacts is just a very useful and great side benefit. Cleaner vehicles and fuels, yes. Uh, we need to reduce private vehicle travel and ownership, okay? So the main point on transportation and what I'm going to get to the, what I call stationary end uses, is we need to think of policy systems or portfolios of policies. There's no one policy and in policy innovation, right? We need systems of policies. So we need fuel-based policies. We need mode shifting policies like land use. Um, we need vehicle-based policies. An example is fuel economy. We need travel distance policies like pay as you drive. I think BC, as an example, just to toss an idea out there, would be an excellent jurisdiction to try pay as you drive. Um, ICBC theoretically could administer that, but there's a big problem in that ICBC has no mandate other than to manage the uh, traffic collision risks, right? They don't have a mandate to save energy for energy security or, or um, for environmental reasons. But um, you know, there's lots of, uh, I'll mention I didn't put it there, Todd Littman. L-I-T-M-A-N with Victoria Transport Policy Institute. A brilliant person, huge you know, resource for all of these things. You know, go check out Todd Littman. 
How much time do I have left? A few minutes, good. I've been talking 100 miles an hour, but that's all we get, we'll, we'll debate. So, uh, I'm gonna stick my neck out a little bit. I'm, a, I'm an instructor at UBC, so I, I don't, you know, I, I actually don't have any mandate to publish and do research, but I am interested in doing research, and this, this is high on my list, and, and, and uh, I'm hopeful I can get some good feedback on this, because I wanna get this, uh, a series of a couple articles published and, and put it out there to propose a new rate instrument, and this is an example of a policy, uh, policy innovation that I have in mind. Um, that would apply to stationary end uses of energy. So I think mobile transportation is a separate animal, different beast, needs different policies. But anything, the, the natural gas, the electricity, or steam, right? There's a central heat plant downtown here. Selling hot water, there's a lot, district energy systems are emerging. So this is the type of rate instrument that would apply for those types of uh, end uses. So, and it's putting together elements that actually exist and, are, and have been used everywhere. It's just putting them together in a unique way is the innovation. Not, none of the pieces are new. So to start with, there are uh, places where they have mandatory energy audits for facilities, right? So the first piece of this rate instrument is that um, there's mandatory audits are, are built into the, the basic charge of, of the utility. And that doesn't mean you get an, uh, an audit every year, but on some sort of periodic, every two years, every five years, whatever makes sense. Uh, it might vary based on the sector, residential, commercial, industrial. The output of that is to figure out there's some cost-effective energy savings. Now, I've emphasized energy savings because I have a very <laughs> clear definition of what I mean by that, but I'll just leave it at that. Um, then the next piece is that you have an inclining block rate, and, and what I'll say is uh, um, behavioral economists call choice architecture. So we have inclining block rates in with BC Hydro here in BC, so it's kind of easy, right? If, for us to understand, this is not specifically about British Columbia, but uh, the whole idea is you have two tier, like on your household energy bill, the first, whatever it is, couple thousand kilowatt hours per month or two billing cycle is at a certain low rate, the rest is at a higher rate. I think it's like six cents and 10 cents, something like that. So the whole idea is you could use an inclining block. Now, there could be multiple tiers, but I'm gonna say, a simple two-tier system where the first tier, I'll call it tier one, is a low rate for all of your non-cost-effective uh, energy savings consumption, right? Um, so that basically says there's a certain dollar per kilowatt hour, let's say for electricity or dollar per gigajoule for gas that could be saved, and there's some process for determining what is cost-effective, okay? I mean, we do these things anyway. They're done through the Utilities Commission and all, all those types of uh, political processes. So the tenant or occupant is the customer who pays for that tier one. Uh, tier two is defined as that cost-effective energy savings fraction based on a facility-specific audit. And there's lots of reasons behind that. Uh, there's so much you know, variation in facility to facility for many reasons that you can't just look at a building and decide or look at someone's bill and decide what that is. So the facility owner is the customer for tier two. And then there's mandatory energy bill financing that could be transferable with ownership to cover that. And this, there's specific reasons for that. So I, I'm just introducing it in a very short form here. I'll talk about some of the benefits of that and then some of the barriers. So, um, you know, one of the big problems with our demands, our end use energy efficiency, and like PowerSmart or Fortis BC or LiveSmart or I'm just using local examples, these exist all over, is that they're voluntary and they're subsidized, they're subsidies. So we're voluntarily subsidizing, uh, you know, customers, if you will, to, to do things that are, that are supposed to be good, and that, that's true, and they, they, they do that. Um, but, you know, it has a number of problems with that, challenges, I'll say. One is low uptake, another is what's called free ridership. So there's a lot of critics saying, well, look, you're giving public money or ratepayer money to people who do something they would have done otherwise. Mm -hmm. Well, this type of thing, there is, they're, they're paying for it themselves, the facility owner, right? So there's no free ridership, there's no subsidy. Uh, that, that has pros and cons, so the facility owner gets the benefit of that too. Uh, so, if someone decides they don't want to invest for that cost-effective savings, you give a choice architecture that says no problem, don't. But you pay some sort of social cost for that fraction of your bill, right? So this is a way to strategically introduce what a lot of people advocate, and I'll say Professor Holberg at UBC 
outstanding smart guy and many people, Mark Jacquard I've heard, we need more social costing in our energy prices. Well, that all or nothing in my opinion is going to be a long time coming to where your entire gas bill is based on social cost. This is a way to introduce it strategically into a real rate instrument that, that can be adopted. Um, it can solve the low uptake, so if people, it's like, hey, we show you, we show you the way, you've got your facility-specific cost-effective fraction uh, defined, you adopt it or you pay a social cost. My prediction, my guess, is you're going to get big uptake. You're not going to get these 10% uptakes of things. You're going to get 60, 70, 80, 90%, perhaps. Who knows? Um, you know, it does address the, there's a lot of, you know, economic literature about information gaps and, and so on and knowledge barriers. This is one way to make progress to, uh, to help solve that. Um, substantial job creation. So part of what I, what I want to do is look at, you know, this is going to take a lot of jobs. First of all, professional services for auditing, but not just that. It's going to be, you know, a lot of end-use technologies that people are essentially going to have a very serious nudge to have to invest in. So there's manufacturing, there's installation trades. You know, there's a lot of jobs that would be created for that. And it's also a real uh, opportunity for behavior intervention. So I teach in an engineering program at UBC, and you know, um, some of our students, you know, may or may not appreciate, but they start hearing about, you know, cognitive. Um, uh, cognitive barriers and, and you know, community-based social marketing. It's like, why we have all this soft stuff? Well, there's a lot of reasons. You know, behavior does matter when it comes to how much energy we consume, the decisions we make for purchasing, operation, maintenance, and so on. And I'll just close with, um, so there are some barriers. Status quo on anything, <laughs> new policies, whatever. Uh, some, some psychologists have called it status quo cognitive bias, right? Uh, the status quo always has a lot of inertia. That's probably a big reason why our consumption is what it is. There's social and political acceptance will not be easy for any new, new uh, policy innovation. There's also legal framework. Um, so trying to invest, uh, address what's called these split incentives. Um, owners of, of buildings would not you know, particularly take e easily or readily to this idea that they're responsible for the cost effective um, DSM or demand side energy management on their facility, but they, they could have some benefits from that too, uh, which we could discuss. So I'm going to wrap up. In summary, will efficiency help? Um, I mean, in my own opinion, let's think about what efficiency is, but no matter how you define it, efficiency alone is not going to help. I, I think there's ample evidence of that. Uh, should conservation be an explicit policy goal? Uh, my own opinion, yes, but you know we got to be careful and look at the global picture. You know, I showed you that graph from Smeal, like uh, you know uh, the average citizen of Ethiopia. No, we can't go there and say you need to conserve. Us Canadian, the average Canadian, the average American. I mean, we have our own distribution of consumption within our borders. Yes, absolutely we should be conserving, and that means absolute reductions. And by the way, we can be healthier and, and better off for it if, if we choose to see it that way. Um, so if, if conservation is a goal, what can be done? Well, systems approaches where it's not just the machinery that us engineers love, people are part of the system. And technology and policy innovation are both important. I mean, I'm an engineer, I love my technology and all that, and that's not saying that's not important, but we need policy innovation every bit as much. So thank you much.